For those of you who are unfamiliar with film, film is a photographic medium that records images using light-sensitive chemicals. Film works when photons hit the light-sensitive crystals on the film and cause a chemical change in the film that creates what's called a latent image. That latent image becomes an actual image when the film is developed in film processing chemicals. This video discusses ultra-fine Red Dragon film and looks at how to use it, the film's characteristics, technical details, and sample images. But, writ large, the content in this video can apply to any red scale film that you buy or make, and if you need to know how to make it, check the references list for a link to a video I did a few years ago that shows how to re-spool standard C41 film to make red scale film. Ultrafine rates Red Dragon at 100 ISO, and that's true for all three of their iterations of it currently, as this film's produced there on version 3. Uh, that's what they're selling through their website. I tested Red Dragon from uh, 25 ISO to 200, and we're going to see throughout the video the results of those tests and how the different ISO affects the image characteristic. Dan over at the Shawnee Union YouTube channel tested this film to a ridiculous ISO 6 and his review is linked in the references if you'd like to check that out because there's a lot of really good information in there as well. Ultrafine Red Dragon is available in only 35mm. However, there are other red scale films available in 120 and if you'd like to try and do this in 4x5 or 8x10, you can do that pretty simply by loading the C41 color negative film into your 4x5 or 8x10 film holder backwards, and that will make sheet film red scale film. The grain in Ultrafine Red Dragon varies by ISO, and realistically I guess it would be better to say that what happens is that the digital noise interference with the image amplifies grain that's already there depending on ISO. In general, this is a higher grain film. Red Dragon specifically is a repack of an unknown C41 film. Ultrafine puts it into the cassette backwards so that the light passes through the film the wrong way around. And we'll see what that means in this video's technical details segment. So it could actually be, and likely is, that Red Dragon is a 400 ISO color film that's processed C41. Typically, the anti-halation layer in C41 film kills off about two stops of light of, of film sensitivity when the C41 film is photographed after being loaded into a camera the wrong way round. And so that means that red scale film is typically about two stops slower than the exact same film stock loaded correctly. Given that Red Dragon is rated by Ultrafine at 100 ISO, the likely donor stock for this is a 400 ISO C41 colored negative print film from either Fuji or Kodak. Tonality and tonal range. Well, I mean, it's red, except when it's not. Color and tones change based on the film's rated speed, with more colors coming in when the film is shot at slower speeds. So as you choose to use slower sensitivities, the oranges creep in, and then the yellows. And in time and with a slow enough speed, greens will come in, though they tend to have a distinct brown cast, but never blues. Acutance is generally poor by color film standards because the light, when it passes through the film's anti-halation layer, loses some focus. Also, the film's layers are in the wrong order, and because of that, the film's layers no longer align with the natural separation of color wavelengths that occur when full-spectrum light passes through a camera lens. That manifests most noticeably in fine detail sharpness loss. But if you don't pixel peep, and if you can use the whole frame from your photo without cropping it, acutance is still suitable for most purposes. But note that this factor, the, the acutance quality, changes by the ISO that you shoot the film at. Contrast with Red Dragon is pretty good, except in the shadows. The shadow data is hard to recover with this stock, and if the shadows don't record data at all, then there is 
no recovery of it in post. Shadows, when underexposed, just become blobs of hideous scanner noise. So if you like dark shadows, overexpose your images a bit more than you normally like to. If you like detailed shadows, well, this film might not be for you. Sharpness with this film is generally poor, except when it's not. Though the acuteness is poor, because contrast is good with this film, you won't notice significant sharpness loss if you don't crop your photos. Now, that's because the contrast is good, and that good contrast helps to give the images sharpness. Up close, the images are going to look softer than they would if the film were not loaded for red scale. Whatever stock this is, and that's true of all red scale films, but if you print the whole negative or digitize the whole negative and don't crop it, you're still going to end up with a, a very suitable result. Dynamic range, or gamma, is generally poor, but it changes wildly more so than other films as the ISO that you select for your, your photos changes. So test your film with different ISOs and match those different ISOs to printed and on-screen versions of your images because the results will differ from the same negative whether you print it or view it on a screen. Now I find that I liked in general the results from Red Dragon at 64 ISO the most because that setting introduces yellows into the highlights and balances sharpness and contrast as well as they can be balanced with the film. I tried the film from 25 to 200 ISO and as I mentioned Dan shot it down to ISO 6 and you'll want to dedicate half of your first roll to taking an identical shot at, at a series of ISO settings to find out what ISO looks best to you either in half or third stop settings however specific you want to get half stop really should be fine what that test will help you learn is that you can achieve different looks from this stock and red scale in general by shooting it at different speeds even on the same roll knowing that can inform the aesthetic choices that you make for future uses with your red scale film so use your test shots to see how the film performs at different ISO settings and use that knowledge then to plan shots that use the film's performance in different light levels or at different sensitivities to the best of that film's abilities Think of red scale film like you would black and white film. With black and white, you're shooting for tones. And with red scale, you're shooting for tones, but they're all red. The red tones can be used to create really moody uh, or dystopian images. Or they can be used to add deep warm tones to an image. It depends on how you want to use the film. And I found that achieving the deep warm tones was very difficult. It only worked on a couple of rolls for me, but it was highly rewarding. Now, honestly, if you can get this film to perform so that the warm tones infiltrate your images without turning everything into a red and black duotone, which means basically shooting it at a slow ISO, then you could make this a really great and, and flattering portrait film because it would be like every portrait was taken with a warm light source like at the golden hour but if you can't do that if you aren't able to to manipulate the film so that it can just add warmth to your images then you may find that the best uses for it are other things graveyards or urban exploration and gritty or rough portraits are really good if you're getting tons of red in it without getting any of the oranges yellows and greens coming through one thing you can do to tip the scales in your favor is add a green filter and we'll talk about it a little bit more in detail but basically when you combine red and green you get brown so we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about this but one of the things you can do with your your film is to add a green filter especially one that's not like a garish uh, green m m green for digital conversion, Red Dragon converts fairly poorly, except when it doesn't. Now, as I discuss this, let's take a look at some of my editing workflow for Red Dragon specifically, but Red Scale uh, in, a, in the bigger picture. 
Here's one of some prickly little branches with a uh, bright light in the background. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate the layer, set the color mode, uh, the blending to color mode. And now I'm going to go into the channels and I'm going to turn off everything except red and yellow. I'm just going to desaturate it to zero. And you can see I'm oversaturating it here so you can see how in the shadow areas of this prickly little branch, the blues, magentas, and cyans show up. And that's because of digital noise. They're only there because of scanner noise. That's a really good way to emphasize the red, yellow, and gold tones in your images. So here it is, original, and with all of the magentas, blues, and cyans uh, desaturated. And you can see the, the changing results. You do lose some shadow detail with this technique, but you get truer blacks. Here's one that I shot at 200 ISO. And so you can see that messing with some of the contrast and auto color things don't really do much good for these images. So uh, I'm actually just going to leave that one basically as it is with added contrast. Here's another one also at 200 ISO. I duplicated it. I'm going to set it to overlay. And that really makes this almost a duotone image with just dark red and black. Preserve, it gives us some nice um, shadow darkness uh, and, get, and basically gives it an interesting black and red look. Here's another one where there's just lots and lots of shadows. So the first thing I'm going to do is overlay uh, the, uh, a duplicate layer. And the next thing I'm going to do is bring in the eraser at, it looks like it's 40%, I think that's what it is, and start erasing selectively in some areas so that I can recover some of the lost shadow detail. Oh, that's, that's not working so well. So the next thing we're going to do is come in and do the color reduction trick where we're going to duplicate the layer, turn off all of the channels that are blue, magenta, and cyan, turn them, desaturate them, not turn them off. We want to make all of the colors as, as black as possible, but the ones that aren't yellow and red. Now what we're going to do is that layer is placed in between the overlay layer and the base layer. So when we go, we go back to the overlay layer and start erasing, we're not going to lose, uh, we're not going to see the um, the blues coming through in the erased areas. Now that I've got it erased, I'm going to pull up a brush and paint the and select a larger size. It's going to be a just a straight black brush, and I'm just going to go through at I think it's again 40% and paint in on the overlay layer to make the the blacks really truly dark black in the shadow areas, and that's going to emphasize the um, the part of the image that I wanted to emphasize while giving us really dark and true blacks. Here's one that is a uh, standard sky, pretty generic, boring image. But uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm go through a couple of the standard auto contrast and color layers. Next, we're going to duplicate and go to a color layer. And you can see again here how in the shadows, Really, originally it was just digital noise, but by pulling in, uh, pulling pulling out the color layer and then desaturating the magentas, blues, and cyans, we can recover some of that shadow detail. Not a whole lot, but we can turn it from just being a disgusting amount of digital noise to being a shadow that has some amount of image depth to it. And you can see the before and after there. In this last shot, you can see the effect of having a green filter over the red scale in the skies. That's why the skies are that golden brown sepia color. And one of the nice things about this technique of reducing the blues, magentas, and greens is that we reduce some of that digital noise, or at least reduce the appearance of it in the images, because it all starts to blend together in the shadows. But we don't affect any of those nice, rich, warm tones. And because we're also, you can desaturate green if there's no green in your image. But if you do have green and you desaturate it, then you're going to eliminate some of that color depth. Everything blue, magenta, and cyan in these images is just going to be digital noise, so scanner noise. So there's no reason to try to preserve it. So those were just six samples showing a couple of entry points into how to process this film in post. Just a couple of really easy techniques that are quick and will help you make the most out of the rest of your image processing workflow. Ultrafine. As is their way, 
provides no technical data for their film stocks. So instead of talking about how this specific film works, let's talk about how color film works generally and what makes red scale work differently. Here is a really, really, really rudimentary diagram I made showing film, color film, C41 film, and the, the layers it has. Each of the dye layers in films often have multiple dye layers within them that capture light at different rates. Fuji, of course, has a fourth layer between the magenta and the cyan layers because, you know, they're Fuji and they're different. Here's how light moves through color film when it's loaded in a standard manner so that it can record light properly. When other All About Film videos on this channel talk about color film dye sensitivity curves, those curves, each of those individual curves, relate to the dye layers in this diagram. When film is spooled backwards for red scale work, here's how light moves through the layers. So what happens with red scale is the, the cyan layer, which functionally absorbs basically everything that passes through the layers above it, contacts a full spectrum of light before everything else, and so it records everything that it can. The cyan layer in negative becomes red. That's why we have red scale when the image is printed or scanned as a positive. So why does red scale have to be exposed a couple of stops or more slower than the negative film's rated ISO? That anti-halation layer is designed to absorb literally all of the light that makes it through the colored layers. And so any light that hits the anti-halation layer, if it's not absorbed, will contact the film pressure plate, which is black, which will absorb more of it, and then it will bounce back through the anti-halation layer to be reabsorbed again before it can interfere with the color film. So shooting C41 stock for red scale means that the film needs the added stops of light from shooting it at a slower sensitivity to make sure that enough photons pass through the anti-halation layer to record an image on the cyan layer. Add some more stops of light and enough photons can make it through the cyan layer to reach the magenta layer. But if you see that blue light cut filter there between the magenta and the yellow layers, that layer prevents enough photons from reaching the blue layer to record blue. That's why red scale that's exposed at really slow speeds can ret return green colors in the images, but it still won't record blues even in the skies. I liked Red Dragon at 64 ISO as a general setting, but I can't argue with the image tones from 32. For filters, try a green filter on this film. Not, like I said, an M&M green or a garish green color, but something that's lighter or maybe an olive colored film. And what's going to happen is that the green is a red light cut filter. And so that green filter is going to cut the red tone harshness on the image and it's going to help return some yellows, oranges, and greens, mostly greens, to the colors of the images. And one of the reasons is because when you take red light and you take green light and you combine them or you filter them together, if you take a red filter and a green filter, what you really end up with making it through those two layers is brown. It's sepia or tobacco, if you've ever seen the tobacco filter for sale. That's just red and green combined. The actual filter I used was like a transparent green olive. That resulted in the skies taking on a rust colored sepia hue because the green tones from the filter cut the amount of red coming through the, the filter into the film. And the green making it through the filter combined with the red layer to create that gorgeous golden sepia brown in the skies. Now, since blue light can't be recorded because it can't make it through the blue light cut filter within the film, the only remaining available color for the skies is that sepia brown color because, well, there's no other data to record. And when you mix green filtered light with a red toned film, there you go, Bob's your uncle, you've got golden sepia. When I went back to film photography about seven years ago, I bought four or five 100 foot spools of ultra fine film and went through them all in about 18 months. 
Now I've gone through another couple of hundred foot spools since then, so I've used a lot of ultrafine film. Ultrafine is a repackager and they do not, that I know of, have their own manufacturing capacity. Insofar as I know, they purchase either overproduced stock, near code bulk, runs that fail to meet quality control parameters, or the production runs that manufacturers perform just to keep their machines running. They then take that film and they mark it with their brand. I haven't really had any issues with ultrafine stock, just a few quibbles here and there. Nothing major. So were I to guess what Red Dragon is, I would guess that it's 400 Superior or Ultramax loaded backwards, probably Ultramax. The color clarity at low ISOs and sharpness looks like Kodak, but the propensity to develop greens in concert with yellows makes me want to say Superior. Ultimately, it doesn't matter who made it originally. Use Red Dragon and enjoy the heck out of it. This stock and Red Scale in general, they're great fun. Red Dragon is a vexing film for me because it performs less consistently than other films from Ultrafine and other films from other sources. When Red Dragon is underexposed, it needs a lot of work in post to denoise the images. When it's properly exposed, the results from it can be really superb. Regardless of the exposure, Red Dragon sometimes has scratches on the negative. Now, this likely comes from the respooling process or as a flaw in the manufacturing process. And if it's the latter, that could indicate that this is stock that failed to meet the quality control inspection at the manufacturer's end. Now, here are three samples that show the exact same scratch pattern on the images. They came from three separate rolls shot through three different cameras, my Nikon FE2, Minolta XK, and Minolta Maxim 5. I would find it hard to believe that all three of those cameras had dust or film travel sharp points in the exact same places, especially since each camera also returned Red Dragon rolls that didn't exhibit this scratch pattern. But at the same time, I also haven't inspected those cameras in detail to see if they could scratch film. Regardless, it's interesting that three different rolls from three different cameras had the exact same scratch pattern in the same places on the negatives. Now, I love Red Scale. It's a ton of fun and I enjoy the heck out of using Red Dragon. And Red Scale is unlike any other film type. Now, the best part about Red Scale is it can be made from any color C41 film. If you make your own at home, each C41 film will have different red scale results, but also always do an ISO test with your first roll of a new C41 film that you're using for red scale. And expect to shoot the film about two or maybe three stops slower than the rated ISO to obtain the richest color array that that film can yield in red scale. The big thing is it's, a, it's an enjoyable type of photography to do probably won't make a living off of it. You probably won't sell any of it professionally unless you're a fine art photographer. But the results can be captivating, interesting, visually compelling. And being able to shoot red scale competently is a nice way of being able to, sh to create a hybrid skill of black and white and color photography where you can get limited color tones but create images that really focus on the black and white characteristics that create and define a good black and white photo.